So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Scordo, and I work as a hydrologist with BGC Engineering. Uh, over the last few years, I've been fortunate enough to contribute to uh, several uh, landform scale designs, uh, particularly in the oil sands region, and uh, over the last couple of years, getting more involved in enclosure planning initiatives. So today I'll be talking uh, about the approach that BBC has been using uh, for landform design and how resiliency or uh, resistance, as we've been talking about, is accounted for in the design process. And before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the help of Joanna Fair and uh, Gordon, Gordon McKenna, who unfortunately couldn't be here today because he's vacationing in Phoenix. But he can send me pictures of him drinking beer on patios, so I know he's not that far away. So before I introduce the concept of landform design, uh, I'd like to start by just providing a really general overview of the mining cycle and the process, just to provide some context to our discussion on uh, ecological resiliency. We've applied this approach um, to several different mine settings, uh, so coal, um, hard rock mining, and particularly the oil sands region. Um, for today's talk, uh, <coughs> I'd also like to provide a few case study examples uh, that we have. Okay. So once a mine uh, begins operation, the mining process itself involves very, several different stages, uh, many of which can occur concurrently on the landscape. Uh, so typically, the mine process begins with tree clearing and dewatering. Uh, from there, an area is uh, soil salvaged for use in uh, reclamation activities later on. Uh, overburden is removed, and in the case of the oil sands, to get towards to the uh, the bitumen. Uh, oil bearing and uh, McMurray formation. And, and then ex you have the extraction of the resource. And as the, so the mining direction is this way, uh, behind the actual mining progression, there's construction of in pits, um, dikes, and behind that, mine waste containment of <coughs> mine waste, and uh, overburden dumps. Uh, and then you might also have soil capping happening, soil capping happening in other places on the lease, uh, and then progressive reclamation. So this whole mining process gives us a legacy of different types of landforms. Um, so we get large mined out pits, um, tailing storage facility, uh, pit walls, and pit lakes, um, and, and large overburden dumps. Um, and these landform features provide challenges for landform designers to reclaim. So if you look at some of these slopes that are in these pictures, you know, at, they're at the angle of repose. Uh, think about how, how you'd go about capping some of those sites. Um, and you know, engineers tend to like uh, linear features in their design. How do you account for and incorporate natural appearance into your design? And how do you integrate with existing features on the landform? So this, all, all of this is where landform design comes into play. Um, so this is an example of an overburden dump, the before and after. Um, in the background here, you can see the mined out pit. Uh, and then the overburden dump itself has been constructed in a series of layers um, or, or lifts. And the goal with this landform is first and foremost to be geotechnically stable, both in the short term uh, in terms of construction during construction and rec reclamation phases, and also in the long term, so closure and <coughs> post closure. The slopes, um, for example, uh, on the this is a, a landform graded overburden dump um, after construction and landform grading. So the slopes here is designed to be geotechnically stable and prevent um, catastrophic movement of sediments downstream. So uh, the traditional reclamation process has, this is an I idealized flow chart, but it has several different stages to it. There's the material salvage uh, component, um, there's material placement and contouring. Um, I guess the point that I wanted to make with all of this is that there really needs to be um, a foundation for 
uh, the reclamation process, and that has to be geotechnically stable landforms. Uh, and you have to have considered the surface water and groundwater sy systems that occur. We need to reestablish those before the reclamation process can begin. Um, so this is a map of, of Syncrude and Suncor, an area I'm kind of most familiar with. And the mining process, I think we all can agree that it produces these really large-scale disturbances. Um, just to give a sense of the scale of disturbance, uh, this is Suncor's Pond 1. It's about 230 hectares uh, here, so you can understand just the scale. Um, so the industry itself progress uh, practices progressive reclamation to reclaim areas as soon as possible after mining. So that because of that, different areas of a lease will be at various stages of this cycle. So if I just zoom into this one little area here, so this is um, St. Crude's base mine right here and Mildred Lake Settling Basin. If you uh, have been to Fort McMurray, you might drive along um, Highway 63 and you might pass some of these landforms. So if you, as you're passing through Easton Pit, as this one is called, you might drive by um, St. Crude's Ben Wetline Construction Project. This is about 57 hectares. Uh, down the road, you'll, you'll be passing a tailings at Landform, an active tailings facility. This area in here is about 1,100 hectares. Uh, there's uh, Gateway Hill, or S4 dump. That's the certified overburden dump um, at St. Crude. And then you're also from the viewpoint right here, you might see um, St. Crude's South Hills, where you see mature over burning dumps with wetlands. So just in a really small area, you're seeing very different um, mining landforms. And all of those landforms really dictate the, the, um, the topography, the slope uh, aspect, and um, so particularly the slope and aspect that you'd expect to get. Uh, the substrate properties and the depositional history. So this, you know, this landform right here is a series of tailing sand interbedded with composite tailings. So you really have to know what the depositional history is and uh, that's going to influence soil moisture, uh, soil water, chemistry, the hydrology, and the hydrogeography. Um, so all of those things have to be considered in, in your design. Um, I was really happy when I was listening to Clive's talk because he, he talked about scale. And that's something I think we tend to think a lot about when we're uh, designing at sort of a closure planning level or at the scale of individual landforms. Um, typically, uh, as engineering in engineering design, we're looking at landforms, a single feature, whether it be an overburden dump or a tailings pond. But you really need to consider how that landform fits into the overall landscape how it's integrated with natural features or um, existing, uh, existing features that could be at different stages of the mine cycle. Also things change. So mine plans change. Um, so you might be integrated with a topography that's static, but then the mine plan changes. And so now you have different landforms that you have to consider at the design level. So we really need to think, think broadly, think at the landscape level, but work typically work at the, at the scale of individual landforms. Um, so at the scale of individual landforms, you're looking at surface water drainage, looking at geotechnical stability, you might be looking at groundwater discharge zones and seepage zones. Uh, where you start to maybe get into the influence of um, the ecological world is looking at macro topography. So if you can design um, features on the landform to shed water off the top of the plateau of a dump, for example. And then into mesotopography, and then microtopography would be stuff like that happens maybe at the operational scale, like surface roughness or um, designing the substrate in such a way to shed water. So at the landscape level and the landform level, a lot of those things are really fixed. You're, you're in, stuck with the mine plan and really have a legacy of <coughs> mine landforms and uh, substrates especially. Um, so one way to kind of overcome a lot of these things is to look at uh, a landform design approach and use the landform design approach to um, approach closure and landform design projects. So this includes uh, 
geotech, surface water, groundwater, soils, veg, and wildlife. And um, those that those of you that know Gordon McKenna, he actually did his uh, PhD here at UVA on landform design, and so he really preaches uh, this approach to design that includes many different ologists uh, in the room to kind of put these concerns on the table. Um, so the landform design involves the layout and configuration of end mine materials like dumps, dikes, pits, etc. Um, in order to establish a closure landscape which reestablishes both form, um, so we haven't really talked about form and function, but form in terms of ponds, wetlands and creeks, and functions in terms of ecosystem functioning, hydrology, vegetation of natural landforms. So as um, academics in the room, you might find yourself being solicited uh, for this type of information that can feed into a landform design. Um, so in, in the absence of you know, a lot of um, a, analogs on the, the reclaimed landscape, we tend to use a lot of information from natural analogs. Uh, and we, we assume that if we replicate some of the form of natural analogs that we'll uh, be able to actually inherit some of those processes and the functions. Uh, so one, one type of uh, natural analog that we use, and this is some work that Boulder has been doing over the last few decades, uh, is looking at a, a geomorphic approach for channel, our channel designs. Uh, so what they've actually done is gone out and looked at reference sites uh, in terms of channels, geomorphology, and, and use that information to help guide what landform design approach we'd use for constructing, uh, designing and constructing channels. So for this example here, I have a, a channel here, a waterway. So what we might be doing when we look at this sort of small stream that's coming through here, we might be designing that to say convey the average flow conditions, like the two year return period. Uh, and then we might not expect to see much erosion for the two year condition. But when we look at peak flows, like the 10 year flow or getting into 100 year flow, you might expect to see some erosion. And then in terms of um, designing the floodplain for the channel, we might be looking at using the probable maximum flood or the PMF to design the floodplain. <coughs> so we are, when we're doing our design, we look at the average flow conditions, but we also try and incorporate uh, peak flows. And I think what we could do a better uh, job is understanding low flow conditions and how that influences um, our flows and also chemistry. Um, so there's, you know, we talked about um, resistance, um, but there are situations where you are using natural analogs to design um, channels, but that you need to incorporate some sort of conservative element into the design. So you might be in a situation where you're using armoring, or it might be a sensitive outlet location, for example. Um, so this is an example on S4 of some of the channels that have been rip-wrapped. Uh, and so those are, there are going to be situations where you just need to have some more conservative built-in, or maybe you don't have enough contributing uh, watershed area to actually get sediment transport and deposition of, of coarse sediment. So we need to kind of incorporate that into the design. Uh, this is an example of uh, a, a pit lake. Uh, at, I think it's at Tech Cool um, Cardinal Operations near Fernie. Uh, so this is an example of a design that they used for one of their pits. Um, and, and then also the outlet channel that they've designed for the, the outlet of the end pit lake. Um, and it does have a bit of a characteristic of a, step, a natural step pool channel. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting when I was listening to Suzanne's talk because uh, as a designer, you're, you're constantly looking at academic papers and taking information where you can to, uh, to help focus your design. So we, we read guidelines, we, uh, we look at academic papers. So, you know, when Suzanne says, if you put like a layer of clay, you know, that might reduce the permeability of, of, of substrates underneath that wetland and you might get better groundwater conditions. So, we take all those things, we write them down, and we try and incorporate them into designs. So all of that stuff is really valuable, especially in terms of what works. Uh, so we're, we're also, you know, we're engineers, so we can't design against everything, um, even though we, we try. So we often take sort of a risk-based approach, and this is uh, one diagram that Gord put together with uh, Daryl Shuttleworth, and it's, um, 
It's 142 things that could go wrong on a reclaimed landscape. And there's a lot that could go wrong. Um, so, you know, as you're part of your design, you're looking to see, well, what things can we try and design against? What are practical? What's reasonable? Um, you know, if we, if, and we use design criteria, people say, well, the EC at this outlet can't go be beyond a thousand micro um, We take that to heart and we use that to guide where the watershed contributing area should be and, and what our inflows have to be. Um, so, yeah, this is just one kind of approach for managing risk on the, the land landscape. Um, obviously, doing a risk based analysis is something we, we do for every land farm design. Um, so another pillar of you know, land form design is really understanding the pre-disturbance condition, and I guess that kind of gets that gets back to looking at things at a landscape level and setting the land form within a landscape context. Um, so this, in terms of the hydrology, this is understanding the regional drainage scheme, understanding where um, outlets can connect with natural occurring uh, natural uh, receiving bodies. Um, what are the di do dominant hydrologic controls? And this, for groundwater, can involve understanding the regional and local flow paths that exist for the site. And so this is from a work that BGC and uh, Sinker did uh, from the MIME 2011 closure uh, conference. So there's some information in there about setting up uh, a regional, uh, or sorry, a local uh, site-wide groundwater model and how we can use that to frame some of the closure planning work that we do. So this is pre-disturbance condition. Uh, and then this is the mining condition. So you know, the mining development process really has a, a significant impact on the surface water and groundwater systems. And these really need to be understood and reestablished before you know, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems can really get established. Um, so in terms of development, there's influences to <coughs> groundwater flow paths. And introduction, introduction of new materials, like I was saying, like tailing sand and composite tailings and mature fine tailings and um, engineered and unengineered fills and all those wastes, material, coke, drilling coke and sulfur. Um, so, you know, like just for example, here this open pit creates this system where, where you're getting groundwater discharge into the open pit now because you've opened it up and maybe have that pit down to the aquifer. Um, so these are things that you have to kind of think about and put your design into the context of a whole landscape. And then at closure, um, also looking at how the landform design is going to, to change the groundwater and surface water systems. Um, so in terms of some work that we did for Syncrude, we, we did a, a, a site-wide groundwater model and then used the results to understand where are we expecting to see seepage on the landform? And can we start to design for wetlands at those locations where we think we're going to get predominant um, groundwater inflows? Um, so just a quick note on, on time. Um, we can all agree that, that um, the processes in the boreal forest occur over significant periods of time. And so as landform designers were often challenged to create landforms that have similar form and doing so and function of natural landscapes, but at significantly shorter time scales. Um, so we have to really understand the limitations of the design, the potential failure modes or um, um, any disturbance that could potentially uh, influence the resiliency of the reclaimed landform over time. And because of that, we really rely heavily on modeling work. So part, this is just a conceptual flow path of some uh, <coughs> modeling that we did for a uh, closure plan. But we have the conceptual landform design that integrates all of the, the mine plan and all the volumetrics. Uh, we do some consolidation modeling on that landform. That can really tell us where we expect to see settlement on the landform. And that information is important for understanding the design. Surface water modeling, groundwater modeling, water quality modeling, um, understanding just from a practical perspective, how you know, can we construct this landscape? Can we, um, how much volume do we expect to have to remove to construct those channels? Uh, and then also we need to look a little bit at surface water, groundwater interactions. 
So you know, all this together, information together, can help kind of inform you know, what type of um, volumes of inflow and outflow of surface water do we expect to contribute to our wetlands, and um, do we have to make changes to the design in order to accommodate that? And we'd also looking at where, what kind of water quality do we expect on the landform and, and over time in 200 year periods. Um, so just, just to show an example, uh, this is uh, Suncor's Pond 1 and it's Wapas Wap Lookout now as it's called. We've been, uh, we helped with the, the design for the landform and so this is what uh, it looked like um, prior to reclamation. So it's a, um, a tailings landform that started being used in the late uh, 1960s and its use was been used up into the late 1990s. Um, so as you know, as you're looking at that landform, what do you do to start reclaiming it? What kind of choices do you have to make? Um, and so geotechnical stability, um, mine waste containment, surface water, and groundwater, those are sort of the big things that you have to kind of look at. Um, so this is a picture of it in 2010 uh, after we've started the, the reclamation process. And these are um, large hummocks that we placed on the landform uh, to act as water table for water table control, start to try and get the, the rooting zone above the, the tailing substrate, and also a series of channels all coming into a wetland. And then this is in 2012, so after revegetation. Um, so lots of monitoring to go on and, and lots of work to be done, but um, these are sort of some of the, the practical scenarios that you encounter when you're trying to, to do landform design at, uh, at this scale. Um, so just to sort of summarize it all up, um, topographic surface water and groundwater systems are significantly altered by mining activities and they really need to be considered in the design and also have to be reestablished before topography um, or terrestrial and aquatic communities can be established. Uh, the boreal forest is complex, and I think we've hit that home a few times today. So we have to really rely on, on natural analogs for design approach, and we really look to uh, academia for input on um, design approaches and, and also from that. <coughs> and we have a reliance on our modeling to assess the, the post-closure landscape over longer time scales. 